buongiorno a tutti, good morning to all, as they would say in Italian, um, and buona domenica. Uh, even the Pope on Sundays, if you're in uh, St. Peter's Square, he always ends his speech um, always saying, Buona Domenica. And when you greet friends after church, it's Buona Domenica, a good Sunday. I can't think of a more wonderful Sunday than to be here uh, with you all and sharing my love. Uh, two years ago in San Francisco, I thought I was doing my last seminar. I thought after 50 years of teaching, that's enough, right? <laughs> and then that wonderful Pat and we've known each other since 1970. I don't think I ever gave a lecture in Los Angeles or a class at which Pat was not in class. So how can you say no <laughs> when she says, please come and teach for us once more and sh share your Italian things? And so then right away I called some Italian friends and we have Tiziana here. Um, and Tiziana is the president and the pusher <laughs> of all the group in Assisi. And as I said, I've been researching there. Well, I did my graduate work over 50, like Paul, my husband says it's not 50 anymore. It's going beyond 50 years. Um, I was the first in my family to go to uh, Italy. Um, and I was born in New York. I wasn't born in Italy. And I went to Florence. I fell in love with it. And I've been going back ever since as often as I can and taking many wonderful stitches with me. And we have just incredible times. And 20 years ago, things were kind of going downhill, and it was very hard to even find a book written about Italian needlework. All the books I did my research from were over 100 years old in Italian. And I have to say today, all of the young people, and they are involved, because just like us, we have to work with our hands, the busier our life gets. And then they discovered um, that they are very good at writing and designing and um, putting to books. So now there are wonderful books out, many of them in English. I keep encouraging them to do them both in Italian and English. And then there are people like uh, Tiziana, and she's from Assisi, and she has a wonderful group. And they're active, and they're all over the place uh, demonstrating and teaching. And this is probably their third or fourth time they've come to EGA, so we're thrilled to have them. And then I want to thank my two angels. The one on the floor is Janine <laughs> from Canada. I, I keep them right where I need them, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and, <laughs> and Janine's been wonderful and um, uh, doing, um, I love doing PowerPoint and all these things, but it's nice to have younger people who are really uh, with it, with the computer. And Janine also does a wonderful Italian blog, okay, Italian needlework. And if you want to know what's happening in Italy, you must read her blog. And then in her spare time when she's not working and working on the computer, she's also helping translating books and uh, writing them, and she with uh, four or five other friends got together, and I still don't know how they squeezed the information out of the Sardinians, because when I went many years ago, they were just, they just didn't want to even show me the stitch, and so they have a book on the Sardinian knotted stitch, so we have wonderful people with us. And then I have another angel, where is she with the red hat, you can't miss her, uh, and this is so exciting because Tiziana, we, uh, they came in at almost midnight on Friday and were up yesterday morning at 5.30 because they had to see the Grand Canyon and we had to show it to them. And so uh, we didn't have time to see. They've brought some wonderful things to share with you. I always keep, um, I always like to bring some antiques for you because as hard as I try to show wonderful slides and I work very hard at trying to do a good presentation, there is nothing like standing in front of the real thing. So I hope if you haven't had a chance, and even if you've looked, you'll have to come back because they have brought beautiful pieces. And I will try to uh, go over those at the end of the lecture, OK? So I'd like to start right now. And what I'd like to share with you are just some of the pieces um, that have just been so special for me over the years. And one of the first I'm going to start with is um, one of the most wonderful lace makers in all of Italy and maybe in all of um, I don't want to say the world, but all of Europe in needle lace. And the Italians really are given the credit by art historians for the development of Italian needle lace in Venice. Uh, next. So here we'll begin. Okay. And here we have Lucia on the right hand side doing her beautiful, actually it's needlepoint lace. In Italian we say punto ad ago. And I even added the words so that you can see the spelling of them. And on, left, on the left side is 
a piece of needlepoint lace I bought over 50 years ago, one of the first pieces I bought. And I just love it because it just shows uh, how the women work, their feet always elevated. And all they're doing is a detached buttonhole, but look at the beautiful things they do with it. Next. Look at the close-up. And I want you to realize that this is all handmade netting. That is not done by machine. And this is the closed buttonhole, the uh, open buttonhole with a twist. And just like any of our basic stitches, they take this one stitch and do a thousand different patterns from it. Next. <clears throat> Traditionally, the pieces were always done in white or acru. Because I remember the old books I read, as I told you when I did my research, and most of the books were over 100 years old, written by men in Italian. And what they always said is that the women were not stitching, but they were sculpting with their needle. Because what was their point of reference? What was that, uh, their inspiration? Was all the carved marble that they see everywhere they turn. No matter if they live in a big city or a tiny little town, the church inside and out is always filled with beautiful carved marble. So they do a beautiful job of open and closed areas, which we refer to in the art world as basso di lievo, okay, the lower and raised areas. And even this netting, here is all hand done, a twisted point España. And this instead, and it's, it's known, this is, I'm sorry, Punto Borano, because it pays homage to the beautiful um, netting done by the fishermen on the island of Borano, where the, the lace making island. Here instead, these little arcs or brides are referred to as Punto Venezia, the Venetian stitch because they refer to all of the bridges over all of the canals in Venice. And of course, the Venetians love their picos, as you see all around. So traditionally, it was always white work, because what they were doing, recreating the beautiful designs that they saw in the marble. Next. Another lovely, and, and a piece, people always say, oh, I found a bargain on the island. There is no bargain. If it's a bargain, it's an Italian design done in the Orient. Uh, the pieces that are expensive, you don't have to, I always have neighbors calling me, oh, I'm going, I want to buy a real piece of Borano or Venetian lace. And I always say, just look at the price and you'll know if you're getting the real thing. So again, a very typical design. And the design, the price is not based on how big or small the piece is, but how many intricate stitches there are. And the more of this Punto Borano, the more expensive because that's a harder stitch to do. Next. I show this piece because it's very rare. A friend of mine shared this. These were from her villa, the drapes that hung in her villa. And for a very short period in Venice, they did what they called architectural designs. And they're very hard to find. So I love sharing this with you. And you can see this, a, a garden uh, with a temple and the gazebo over here, the lemon trees. And then I love that this piece, which was inserted at the base of all of these drapes in the villa, are not squared off, but have this beautiful curving line. Next. Another part of it, these were all part of a garden scene all around. Next. Then we have an upstart, Lucia, who for many years worked packing glass on the next door island of Morano. And she decided, she was a lace maker. When they asked her how long she'd been doing lace, she said all of her life. And um, she is not a trained artist. She just does her, all of her own designs. And she decided that if the glass blowers who did traditional work could also do very contemporary pieces, why couldn't the lace makers do this? So of course, the uh, older ladies were a little upset with her, but they couldn't condemn her because she was one of them. And <laughs> many, many people over the years have tried doing the lace in color, and it didn't really didn't fly. Instead, Lucia has a beautiful innate ability to do this. And this is the street on which she lives. And she's a master of all of these old techniques. In fact, she has spent a lot of time at the museum uh, in their um, storerooms examining old pieces. And she has really revived some of the very old, intricate pieces. Next. And so she has done beautiful scenes of her island of Borano. Next. And here you can see all of these wonderful ang angles and the beautiful layers that she has done everywhere. 
even the clothesline. <laughs> Next. And then this was a piece that was used as a poster by the city of Venice to advertise the Regatta Astorica, the um, gondola race. And so here she did a beautiful design using the bows of the gondola. Next. And of course, she's familiar with seashells. And so this is a beautiful, intricate piece where you can see all the intricate stitches and patterns that she has revived. And once again, how lovely this is that she just followed the natural shapes of the, piece, of the shells rather than squaring it off. It's a wonderful design principle that we can all use. You might be sitting there and say, well, I'm never going to make lace or I'm never going to use these as embroideries. But I find no matter where I travel to, and I look at what they've done in embroideries or whatever lecture, you always pick up all these wonderful ideas that you can apply to your own work, your own designing. And for me, the fact that she can incorporate it with this irregular, beautiful edge is spectacular. Next. A wonderful piece of undersea life, vegetation. And her biggest problem, of course, is finding colored threads that work for her. So she's always trying new ones. And she was very fortunate about 15 years ago, she read of a knitwear factory in Milan that was closing. And she went to see them. And she bought up all of their leftover threads. And they have worked well. But after that runs out, it's very hard. It's getting harder and harder to find the right threads that have no stretch. But once again, in this piece, it shows you her vocabulary of stitches and the intricacies of these beautiful stitches, all based on one stitch, the detached buttonhole. Next. A very special piece, uh, the, um, the protector of the island uh, here is San Martino, St. Martin. And this is at the time in which he um, meets a beggar and slashes his cloak and gives half of his beautiful cloak to the um, beggar. And what I think is so spectacular, it, look at how she chose to do the beggar uh, versus the knight, St. Martin. And even though they don't have faces, they express so much just through the stitches she has chosen. And then the horse. Don't you feel like he's ready to gallop off? And then I have to keep reminding myself, it's done always with one simple basic stitch and many, many variations. You can, I'm sorry you can't see the whole finished piece on this. I am never taking these photographs in the most ideal situations. This one, I remember, was over a pillow to get something dark on it. But the top of the piece is not squared off. Again, it has points representing the points of the Church of St. Martin on the island. Next. And of course, the most famous holiday in Venice is a very elegant carnivale. It's not the wild one that's here in New Orleans. It's a very elegant one. And one time when I asked some of my Venetian friends, why is it so elegant? And they go, because Venice is a very elegant city. And so Lucia, this is her first one she ever did in carnivale. And she has always tried to pay homage to the traditional lace. So here you see the Doge's Palace in the typical white work. And look at the beautiful dimension she has gotten on that. And then, like she said, oftentimes a carnival or the beginning of carnival is in February. And it's cold and it's rainy and oftentimes very foggy. And I've had the good fortune of being there. And you're walking through the streets and it's very foggy. You can hardly see ahead of you. And all of a sudden, out of a narrow alleyway, will pop up these costumed um, fig or people. And so she's captured that very nicely. Next. And this I don't own, but my granddaughter, my first granddaughter, got this as a gift from Lucia. And she said, well, she has to be your first. She has to be a, a princess, a Renaissance princess. And when I'm studying these pieces on my own, sitting in my studio, looking at them, I can actually hear the music and see this beautiful piece dancing. Because look at the, the uh, clothing. The, the skirt, I mean, it just, you can see that she's dancing, her veil, and the beautiful details here of the sleeve, the bodice. Next. And then one year she did the, all of the zodiac pieces. And um, several people that were with me wanted to buy different ones, and she said no. They were created, they were born together, they must leave together. And so 
a couple that were with me decided to buy them all and they had a screen for their living room and they made them into a beautiful screen. Next. Uh, every year there's a very important uh, gondola race in Venice. It was just a few weeks ago. And it's always been the tradition that the winner, the top three winners, get a piece of glass made for them. And about 10 years ago, they heard about Lucia's work, and she had the honor as the first lace maker to do this. She had to do three of them, and they were all um, encased in plexiglass and presented to the winners. And once again, the rosette uh, is a rosette that you find on the gondola, and here are the oars. And she said it's very interesting. All of her lifetime watching the race, there's always a whole group that vie for first place, then a few that come after that, then there's a long wait, and the stragglers come at the end. So that was the reason she designed it that way. Next. Well, of course, as you can tell, I love needle lace because you can do so much with it. And until I went to Italy to do my uh, graduate work, for me, bobbin lace was always trimmings to use. And then I went to San Sepulcro, which is in Umbria, where the ladies are from downstairs. And I, I marveled because this was bobbin lace, tombolo, and I had never seen it done in these beautiful figures. Bobbin lace did not develop in Italy. Art historians give credit for that in the northern countries. It was a faster, cheaper way to uh, duplicate or try to duplicate the beautiful, very expensive, elegant, detailed needlepoint lace. And this is one of my favorite pieces. The ladies in the town of San Sepulcro, which is a very important lace center in Italy, copied a Roman frieze that's on the side of their city hall. And I have a close-up next. And here you can see the beautiful detail. And I just marveled. I loved the border. I loved the background. Uh, and then another magnificent piece. And this is done by a group of ladies that have a school. And, and that term is used loosely. And they work near Bologna in Forli and Meldola, two little towns uh, east of Bologna. And when I did an international exhibit years ago, uh, this piece probably was the most popular piece. Um, I could have written 500 orders for them, and they wouldn't repeat the design. <laughs> so, and it's, oh, it's after one of the Vatican angels. You find the painting, the fresco, of these angels uh, at the Vatican. And to me, this is exquisite. And I never knew that bobbin lace could come to this height. And they've do, have done a lot of gold. And gold is difficult to do, those of you who do bobbin lace. Next. A little more detail, right, to show you the movement. Uh, this is called Punto Sorbello, found in Umbria. And uh, the piece, uh, there'll be pieces of them on display downstairs, too. It's also, when I go around, uh, and Umbria is the area around Assisi, where Assisi is Perugia. When I'm showing the pieces around, they always, the locals call it Punto Pischiello, because that was the name of the villa where the young ladies around 1900 would go to learn how to do this stitch. And to me, this pillow just exemplifies a beautiful example of what those authors 100 years ago said. They are sculpting with the needle. This, to me, truly looks like um, carved marble. And notice on the side, they have wonderful little tassel buttons. Next. And here's another piece, a wonderful textural stitches. I love textures, and I think they've done a magnificent job. And then they don't like hard edges. So notice how they've used the detached buttonhole or needle lace to do a wonderful edging. Next. And I just love this piece. And I'm, I still haven't mastered all the teachers, uh, stitches, so I'm not ready to teach this. But I just think this is such beautiful work very dimensional. And again, things like this or the edgings that you see, um, how can you adapt it to the work that you do? It's wonderful, the combinations. And they aren't really doing new stitches. It's the way they use the old stitches in new ways, looking the, at them in new ways. Next. And of course, I have to talk about punto tagliato or cut work. And I remember my grandmother, who was from Italy, uh, from the Sorrento area, would have all of these beautiful nightgowns. This is one of them. And they were all done in beautiful cut work. And of course, when I was little, I didn't even know what the word trousseau made. But uh, as a young girl, she had to make her corredo or her trousseau. And years ago, in some of the very chic 
uh, seaside areas of Italy, the young women would go to their grandmothers and get all of these beautiful linen cutwork nightgowns, and they used them as beach dresses over their uh, <laughs> swimsuits. Very, very elegant. Next. And this is an incredible piece I wish I could tell you I owned. I was giving a lecture in Hawaii many years ago, one of many lectures there at the museum in Honolulu. And afterwards, a lady said, oh, I would love to meet with you tomorrow because uh, my aunt from Boston uh, has this beautiful outfit, and she passed it on to me. And this was part of a, morning, a, a walking suit, linen walking suit, white. The skirt was plain and midi length. And the jacket, again, does this not look like beautiful carved marble? And look at the beautiful balance of open and closed areas, the cut work, the raised work, the reticello. And again, look at the edges on the cuffs and around the border and around the collar. Didn't leave it plain with just a hem. But they go just that one step further to make it more elegant. And all hand buttonholed. That wasn't done by machine. And right after that trip, or a few months later, I was teaching in New York City. And I'm originally from New York, and so I always go to the Met. And I was down the stairs, and they had an exhibit. And what was the exhibit on but 19th century white suits? And many of them were similar to this. Not the same, but very similar. But this is truly a masterpiece. For some reason, the lady didn't want to just give it to me. But anyway, <laughs> it, was, it was in good hands, and she appreciated it. It's beautiful, and I'm thrilled to share it with you. Next. <laughs> 